here's my good friend, Aina. While being a very humble guy, he's also a total rock star. He, he's worked for the WHO, Gates Ventures, and is the first author published in the Lancet. Here's Aina in his own words. I'm Aina Olu, I'm a second year MBA student. I am from Lagos, Nigeria. I'm a physician by background. I've worked significantly in public health. I lived in Switzerland before I came here, and now I'm going into biotech, New York City. Why MBA? So I was, you know, in Geneva, uh, and I was working on global health, and I thought to myself, what would the future of healthcare look like? I wagered internally that it'd be different, that there'd be a lot of innovation and new therapeutics, and the solutions to that were not where I was. I didn't know what I was searching for, but I knew that if I went to a school, like MIT, where they were trying to get on the cutting edge of everything, I would get better insights into what the future should be like, and I would get the opportunity to contribute to that future. So I took a leap of faith, you know, decided, heck, two years of my time ain't that bad. The MBA is my way of going through that black hole into this new universe. Last time I saw a patient was in 2017. And that's because I've been doing all this public health work. I'm still a clinician by heart. It's funny, I've done a public health degree and now I'm doing an MBA degree, but the source of my strength is very much, you know, my background as a physician. It's my clinical knowledge. I would stay in the field of healthcare going forward. I'm coming from that space. But I think on the one hand, you know, I try to, you know, I know I'm a physician, but I also try to bring all the parts of me and the part of me that's worked in public health at a global level, but also at like the local level in some of these countries. The part of me that's an international citizen or citizen of the world, the part of me that's very versed with the US. I think it's a plus that I, I did medicine, I practiced it or I trained in it, but I think ultimately it's like, how do I use that as the foundation? Think of it like a pizza as the dough, and then all these other things are the toppings, you know, to ultimately de deliver something useful for for someone, you know, you got that public health pepperoni and that, that MBA strategy, you know, mozzarella, but you got the clinical medicine as the base. It's forever going to be the base. I'm in many ways thankful for the perspective, for the work ethic I derived from it. Um, I was very young when I did clinical medicine, and I think there was a certain, certain things you see in terms of like getting to know people, building that skill of talking through difficulties, um, talking to people who are going through hard times. Um, interpersonal, I attribute a lot of like my know-how to that part of that part of my life. You know, you could still work in healthcare and make significant changes, even if you're not practicing. I saw that a lot when I was at WHO, making policies for countries, helping them think through financing mechanisms. What I would always want to do is to stay close to the clinical community. So I would still read journals, I'd still go for webinars and conferences because I feel like, once again, it's the base layer. I can only talk so much about BATNA and net present value. <laughs> if I'm not tying it into something that has to do with somebody actually getting better, I feel like I'd have lost my, my anchor. So the passion plus the time and the effort put in makes it just ideal. I'm curious, but I don't think I'd ever get bored of healthcare, even with all the curiosity I have. Now, especially after COVID, being an MIT in general, being in Boston, so many people are keen to get into healthcare, but they don't have the kind of background that you do. Public health lens, physician lens. How are they supposed to get that though base? Where, where are they supposed to build from if they don't have that kind of first-hand knowledge? No business school has this amount of companies that are working in the healthcare space in their backyard. Very backbone of the science that powers healthcare is done at MIT, at all its labs. Now, for those who don't have that background 
I think there are two things, top, bottom approach. Uh, from the bottom approach, there are opportunities for them to engage within MIT. You know, take a class that talks about this at Sloan, you know, talk to other folks. But from the higher or top approach, many of these companies that are in this space, healthcare, at whatever level, startup, and enterprise, specialty pharma, you name it, they need people who bring a different perspective to the table. They need people who could handle core functions of their businesses, whether it's great finance or corporate strategy or operations excellence, so on and so forth. And I find that for anybody who goes into this space, they kind of get acquainted. You know, you meet all these people are like a certain pharmaceutical company, no background in anything, but they're telling you more about a drug than you'd ever know as a clinician. Where I think the disconnect is, other companies have succeeded in getting MBAs that are general that are usually generalists to believe that they can chime in. You see a company like Tesla. At its you know core, it's an engineering company. They make automobiles and they are enabled by different technologies. And they've gotten MBAs to believe that there's something called product. Don't care there's something called product. Every drug is a product. You have people going to pure logistics enabled companies like Amazon and then they say there's a product. So I just feel like on that top approach, people have to relate to them that, look, we're trying to build the future of how people get treated. We're trying to create products that would change a gene so that a child doesn't have a symptom. Can you help us strategize around that? That has to be done a bit more on their end to get MBAs to see the value of the space. Cha, cha, oh, 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 bongo la, bongo cha, cha, cha. Action! Who should do an MBA? If you are not satisfied and you worry that there may be a ceiling in your professional course, you potentially get bored easily, you see yourself doing multiple things, you maybe want to be called polymath, I think that's the word. You want to pivot, you want to network, I think that's what it's for. It's certainly a different type of degree whereby you kind of meet people who are doing all types of interesting things. But I think there's a commonality. Everybody's trying to elevate. They're all trying to do something better. I think the MBA is pitched and is an accelerator. Um, and if you feel like you want to get a decent launch pad into something, it could be in the same space, it could be a startup, or it could be something different. And if you potentially worry about what you're doing, you know, like in five years time, I'm not going to want to do this. Go do an MBA. Broaden the horizon. That would be my recommendation. I don't know that's universally true, but I, I'd stand by it. Dimelo con sincerità nelle che si fa. So it gives me some tools um, to really think about it critically, as opposed to just trying to imagine that people are making rational decisions, which is what we all imagine that they do. In addition to that, one of the things I'm grateful for is you get to see how other people think. And I don't know that there's any other setting like business schools, places like MIT or, other, or, or our other peer schools where you get your variations and diversities in perspectives. And that's as a result of different places people are coming from. Mm. You know, their ideologies differ professionally, geographically, so on and so forth. Whereas if I'm in public health, most people that are going to that are already altruistic and they're trying to save lives and so on and so forth. How do I then plug in these, you know, added knowledge, these contacts into something that makes sense for the future? It was not because I was in need of what to do with myself. Once again, I had a very problem. So there has to be sense. So I actually got to get back to doing things because I left things, you know. Um, I got engaged while I was here. I worked for the WHO when the pandemic struck because they were short on staff. Um, I've gone to expand my coast and, you know, learn more about new spaces. But we all left things, like real things. Some of us, even more consequential people, left families, so on and so forth, right? So I feel like, once again, you know, let that get open, let us go. You know, my take. But we come here, like, literally, just so that we could go to the next level. We didn't come here because MIT is where we want to stay. Mm -hmm. We came here because we're trying to figure out what next it is. And then there's this 
fallacy that once we find that, then all is lost. Mm. I feel like for me, networking and staying connected has been a necessity because I've lived in like six different countries in my life. Like MIT couldn't separate me from people I want to stay in touch with, even if they tried. Right? If not, I wouldn't be talking to my parents who are oceans across, or my friends who are in Geneva, or people I studied with that are, you know, so on and so forth. So I, I'm not worried. Mm -hmm. I think the true takeaway that the MBA, you just get exposed to so many different things, so many people who are doing incredible things, your peers, people who already have that track record. You get to intern, you know, companies that are moving and shaking planet Earth as we know it. You get leadership, high performance, and all that just gets normalized. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. It's a big deal to get one of these opportunities. And we get it like, even when we think COVID or outside COVID, we get it. So that, that, that I'm good for. Sure. Lest you drink your own Kool-Aid, you know. Uh, there's this guy who came to our class, the CEO of Merck, the partner CEO of Merck, um, Kenneth Frazier. He said anywhere he goes, there is a diet doctor, Pepper, waiting for him. That's because a long time ago, you know, somebody got into his office and you know, found out that his refrigerator in the office, I think, had a lot of Dr. Pepper, and they assumed that he must like Dr. Pepper a lot. So. He goes places, travels around, and he knows that wherever he goes, somebody keeps a diet doctor pepper. And he knows that somebody's actually putting in the work to provide him with this perceived comfort they think he needs. Uh, but he knows that he's only getting that because of his position. You know, so it's part of like understand like you know. Now, if you just saw that there and you thought you deserved some wrong with him, but if you're aware that people are doing it. And you're getting if you're if Dr. Pepper is there guaranteed, somebody who should have told you you're being silly, they didn't tell you that. You know, when you were late, they didn't tell you that. They're making a lot of accommodations for you, right? So um, once you see that Dr. Pepper is a reminder that look, man, my life is in a sort of way protected, and I'm not. You may feel like oh, why is the, the quarterly call these CEOs or sort of these bullshit arms that beating down on me? But in general. People get flat for what type of things that you be getting. So I think that self awareness is just something I have to think ahead. Especially if you go on to do incredible things. Anyway, I've said enough today. <laughs>